uh, two slides to be presented. Uh, the first one will be presented by Peter. And before I introduce the Peter, uh, just briefly to remind you on the rules. So um, you can put your questions in the Q&A or raise your hand if you want to talk. The speaker should uh, be muted while the other speaker is speaking. And we should respect altogether diversity, of course, and other people involved in the conference. So the first paper is related uh, to the um, bibliographic database. It's entitled the Road Towers Structured Affiliation Information in a National Bibliographic Database. Uh, it's an issue we are all dealing somehow with that. Uh, when I say we, I mean all we are involved in the development of research infrastructure at one university. And I'm also in that group. And the authors of this paper are Peter Aspislach, Tim Engels, and Ralph Gans. Uh, just to find a couple of information. So, Peter, you can start sharing your screen while I'm reading a couple of information about you as a speaker. So, Peter is data manager at ECOM at the University of Antwerp, where he's currently working on the enrichment of bibliographic data and the development of the Academic Book Publishers Register, which is also an interesting project, I believe. He's involved in several data management projects in social sciences and humanities, like Bellerite, uh, a comprehensive database of the composition of Belgian governments. He studied uh, political science and contra contemporary history at the University of Leuven. So Peter, uh, you have 15 minutes completely for your presentation. Please leave a couple of minutes just for some questions. Okay, thank you, Dragan. Thank you for uh, inviting us. Um, so uh, I'm Peter Aspislach. I'm sorry, working... Peter. Uh, again, your, your presentation is uh, in um, your presentation mode, which can be seen only by presenter. So is it possible? Um, okay. So we see, you know, the next slides. We should we see notes and so on. Do you see the slide right now? Yes, but also uh, on the left side we see, you know, the, the small slides. So it's not in the full mode. I, I, yeah, if you press there. Do you have to press here? I, I believe. No, it's still in this uh, mode. Um, and do you see my... Um, uh, I mean, we can see your slides now. My slides, that yes. That's the, that's the most important thing that you... Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, the uh, road towards uh, structured affiliation information in a national uh, bibliographic database. So after some background, I will uh, zoom in into what, what we mean with affiliation data in our uh, case, and then talk about the infrastructure procedures and staff we use and employ. Uh, I will zoom in to the the way we retrieve the data, the way we register the data, and some opportunities that we have uh, encountered or that, that we have um, discovered during this project. So to give you a little background, uh, I'm working at uh, ECOM at the University of Antwerp. We are a center for R&D monitoring, and we manage the Flemish Academic Bibliographic Database for Social Sciences and Humanities. Uh, and that's a data source for a performance-based research funding mechanism. So the um, VHBB SHW uh, compiles all the research outputs of the humanities and social science faculties uh, of the five Flemish universities. Um, the database um, is um, based on two um, sources. Um, the first source is uh, the Web of Science publications. These are all the Flemish publications that are indexed in the Web of Science. And then the uh, second part is the VABB only publications or the publications that are not uh, included in the Web of Science. Recently, uh, a new parameter has been uh, introduced for funding distribution. And that recent that parameter that is international internationalization, and on the left side of the screen you see the uh, percentage of all the components of the um, 
evaluation parameters and internationalization, international publications uh, are, are um, uh, representing um, seven and a half percent of the, um, the funding and distribution parameter for one part. So, um, but what are our data sources? So the uh, internationalization uh, data or the parameter is uh, deduced from the author affiliation data. A publication uh, gets an increased weight if it has two or more authors of whom at least one of the authors has a non-Belgian affiliation. However, the data is not yet available in our database, so we do not, do not dispose of the affiliation data. Um, and in order to implement the internationalization uh, parameter, uh, this, it requires the collection of affiliation data for all publications for a 10-year time frame. Um, so how do we collect that data? On the one hand, we have the publications indexed in the web of science, that data can be downloaded relatively easy. But the other part uh, requires a combination of manual data uh, collection or the consulting of other external bibliographic data sources. So for almost 20,000 uh, publications, which are not indexed in the web of science, we have, which have two or more authors uh, in the past 10 years, we need somehow to collect the data in another way. So for those 20,000 uh, publications, what do we consider as affiliation data? First of all, uh, the affiliation data in this project is required on publication level and not on publication author level. Uh, it is due to um, time constraints and uh, the fact that it is an, an, a labor intensive uh, um, procedure. Second, what are valid sources for the affiliation data? So uh, first, uh, that can be the um, non-Web of Science external bibliographic databases like Crossref, like Scopus, um, but it can also be um, affiliation da data as it is printed on the full text or in the list of contributors of a publication. And the third uh, valid source is the affili affiliation data as it is shown on a official web page of uh, a publication on the website of the journal or the publisher, uh, mostly a DOI redirected uh, um, web page. Uh, what do we consider as valid affiliation text? Uh, in order to register it, the institution has, been mentioned, has to be mentioned explicitly in the uh, in the affiliation text uh, on the publication. If only a country or a city is mentioned that we consider that as insufficient. And there's also a temporal dimension, which means that uh, the affiliation we register is the affiliation at the time of the publication. So if we register affiliation data uh, for publication of 2012, uh, the affiliation as it was in 2012, is uh, valid and not um, um, the affiliation that it did today, as this might have changed. So um, in order to uh, collect the affiliation data for those 20,000 publications, uh, what kind of infrastructure uh, do we use? We have um, um, created a central database and an online application, a web platform, which has to deal with both the imported data from external bibliographic data and the data that has been manually processed, uh, has been manually processed by our collaborators without interference, which means that if we already have downloaded the data from external bibliographic databases, those uh, publications do not have to be uh, registered or, or processed by uh, the people who are manually um, um, collecting the affiliation data. Uh, we register the affiliation data via a wizard-like web form. Um, and uh, we also uh, um, 
saw that uh, it requires a huge degree of flexibility uh, on the programming uh, part as uh, it is an ongoing process and it was also learning by doing uh, in registering the affiliation data. The data is uh, internally validated uh, and it required a lot of staff and coaching for the staff. And while we are collecting the affiliation data, we are also checking additional or adding additional data. For example, if in our bibliographic database, it turns out that for a certain publication, we do not have a DOI. Well, then during this process, we add a DOI. Uh, the same applies for an abstract. So that means that uh, the, the, the efforts we invest in this affiliation project also benefits uh, the, uh, the, the, the enrichment of the complete uh, bibliographic database. So um, this is a screenshot of our um, coding form. So whenever uh, some of our, a collaborator of us uh, starts um, um, coding a record, he, he or she first uh, um, uh, gets information about the bibliographic data, so how to, to, to uh, retrieve the correct uh, document. And then afterwards, uh, in the second stage, uh, they can code uh, the, um, the concrete affiliation data by uh, pasting uh, the, the text in a, an, an text field and then coding both the country and the organization um, in a structural way. So how do we retrieve the data? As I already said, we uh, have two main channels. The first one is uh, by consulting external bibliographic databases. We consult those databases by matching by unique identifier, a, for example, a DOI in Crossref and Scopus, uh, an MS Academic, or uh, in the book citation index and emerging sources citation index, we use a uh, UT code if this is, uh, uh, if we have that code. A second uh, matching procedure was, is matching by title. Um, however, only for a limited percentage of publications, we have data available. So we had about, we found about 10,000, uh, almost 11,000 matches, but we only could download uh, affiliation data for uh, about one fourth of the pub publications. So resulting in uh, only 11% um, of the affiliation data uh, being being imported from uh, external bibliographic databases. That data was normalized and integrated in the database. So that means that 90% of our uh, affiliation data um, need to be retrieved manually in some way or another. We have two major retrieval texts. First of all is online downloading the full text or consulting the affiliation data on the website of the journal uh, and the publisher. And a second track is if we do not find the data online, um, we are con consulting hard copies of the publications in academic libraries. And in order to have a proof of the affiliation data, which need to be provided to the uh, to the different uh, universities when a check is being uh, um, being ex executed. Uh, we scan the data via a scan tent uh, and uh, the doc scan application. However, it turns out to be uh, quite complex. Um, we have to coach the staff in uh, identifying valid documents and uh, how to prioritize uh, and, and um, ask them to prioritize full text over journal, uh, over websites. Um, because um, the identification part is very, uh, is, is quite uh, tricky because often uh, an, a publication is published in another, uh, um, in another journal or another um, 
um, edited volume with the same title uh, at another uh, date in time, but with the same authors. So uh, it's a bit, it, it really requires uh, coaching in order to identify the, the correct documents. Peter, two minutes, please. Yeah, okay. So how do we register the data? Uh, we use per, a persistent identifier based on the grid database. So uh, uh, on the, they are imported in the application uh, for the data uh, from external databases or manually it's signed via an uh, autocomplete field in our uh, application. Um, however, GRID doesn't capture all organizations due to the fluid nature of a lot of uh, research organizations, universities, mergers, and also due to the fact that a lot of uh, our uh, publications are local uh, Flemish publications uh, or in a non-Anglo-Saxon context, and that's not that easily captured by international databases. Um, so, which means that uh, one third of the uh, organizations that were coded uh, were not found in GRID and were manually added to our application. So we found uh, affiliation data from 121 different countries. And so far from 3,632 different institutions. So this project uh, highlights the complexity of uh, retrieving affiliation data beyond the traditional channels and databases. So far, we 80% uh, of our um, uh, work has been completed. Um, and we see also uh, some space for, for some opportunities. Uh, first of all, it would be helpful if we had a uh, uniform and machine readable author affiliation metadata scheme included in every uh, publication. Second part uh, or second point is uh, the universal availability of uh, affiliation data on publication websites, on uh, in previews in Google Books, for example, uh, a continuously uh, stimulating um, publishers uh, and editors to assign a DOI to their publication. And a uh, fourth point is really taking the local context into account. Uh, uh, because uh, especially in, 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 in languages like, like Dutch, not, not that many uh, publications are, uh, are indexed in uh, um, rar, uh, larger databases. So um, it's, um, these are three, four opportunities that, uh, that can be taken into account. Okay, thank you. It was a little bit fast, but there's a lot of lot to tell uh, about uh, uh, affiliation data. But yeah, Peter, thank you very much. Yeah, definitely very very interesting topic. So we could discuss about that for four hours. You know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and also, I'm looking forward to, to see your results in that uh, academic book publishing register. Hopefully, yeah. it will be also present in some moment at ICT SSH conference. It's also in this topic somehow. Yeah. Uh, there is one question, as I see in Q&A box, but more generic than related to just your presentation, but maybe you can provide a response. Uh, there is one question from the Dr. Uh, Ram, Rah, Ramkumar uh, Krishnamurti. Uh, I have a question how to check my published article on Web of Science database. So it depends on the licensing and so on, but maybe you can provide some response. Uh, how to check? Uh, um, to, to check it, the, 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 if it's available in the... Um... I think the, uh, that Rahon uh, asked whether it's possible to, and how, which link to use to see what is indexed in Web of Science for himself. But I know um, from my country, we have uh, available access to the Web of Science data and it's not free of charge. So I'm not sure for your region. Uh, yes, it's, uh, we have an, uh, um, a subscription uh, via the university. Um, and uh, well, that's how we uh, have access to the, to the Web of Science. Mm. We also have uh, access to, to Scopus. So uh, we, we um, uh, are trying to maximize the, the, all the, the potential sources that, uh, that can contain all our publications, but um, uh, the 
point is here we we are really talking about public how to retrieve the data for publications who are um well who are beyond the the, the large uh publication uh um databases yeah okay peter thank you very much unfortunately we don't have time for more yeah. discussion at the moment but of course i would like to encourage people to, to you know to chat you yeah. or write some message in the chat or in q and a or contact you directly via email of course for further okay. discussion about that thank you very much yeah there is one more question from the young Dvorja here in the q and a if you yeah. have time please i'll i'll go into answer your, it. yeah provide the answer to the young. yeah and we are going further and i'm going to invite the i'm going to introduce the next speaker which should be the christopher Rauch, and he will talk about the high level resources keys for collaborative historical ontology publication uh, Christopher, you can start sharing your screen while I just briefly read a couple of information from your biography. So, uh, Chris is currently a PhD student at Drexel University's College of Computing and Informatics. He holds Master of Science degrees in Library and Information Science and Information, Syst information Systems from Drexel and uh, uh, GD from uh, Butcher's Law School. It's, um, let's say, doctoral status, I think, in, in, in in, in law or something as like that. He's a recent collaborator with the Metadata Research Center at Drexel and a former Army National Guard signal officer. So it's quite interesting career so far. So Chris, the microphone is yours. Please try to present your results in 10 minutes and then leave a couple of minutes for the discussion. Hi, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Rausch. I'm uh, in my first year as a PhD student at Drexel's College of Computing and Informatics, as you've mentioned. And I'm presenting the paper on behalf of my co-authors uh, from the Drexel Metadata Research Center, Jane Greenberg, who's our director, Matt Kelly, Sam Brabus, and Joan Boone, as well as John Kunze from the California Digital Library, uh, one of the architects of the archival resource persistent identifier scheme as well as Professor Emeritus Peter M. Logan, who is responsible for the 19th Century Knowledge Project. I'm going to discuss, and he'll be joining us for the discussion uh, later on. And here are my collaborators, as you can see on the screen. Um, now, the 19th Century Knowledge Project is using historic editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica to build an extensive digital collection for the purposes of studying the 19th century knowledge uh, and its transformation. So the mechanism to do this we've chosen is the Encyclopedia Britannica and various editions. Um, the different editions were the most comprehensive representations of what constituted official knowledge throughout the 19th century. Uh, those editions also demonstrate changes over time in the nature of knowledge in the English speaking world. Uh, these works were already available on the web, but the existing textual data, which was derived from image files, uh, was too inaccurate to be used for text mining. So the Knowledge Project is creating the first accurate and standards compliant textual data set uh, for this corpus of information. In order to extend the collection's usability, we apply techniques to automatically generate metadata for the 100,000 plus entries and tag them with both current and historical subject categories. We are involved with a series of experiments in order to identify the feasibility of tracking concept drift over time within the course corpus. Uh, the project begins with running OCR on existing image files of encyclopedia pages, which are then converted into XML. The data is encoded with standards developed by the Text Encoding Initiative, uh, which is a consortium that develops and maintains a standard for the representation of text in digital form. We then process the TEI pages and segment them into separate files for each entry in the Britannica. Finally, we add topical metadata to each entry. These master files for the new digital edition can then be used to generate data sets in a variety of formats, including XML, JSON, and uh, text. The purpose of this is to be able to run textual analysis routines on data uh, to discover things such as how, to use, how terms change over time in their usage. The vocabulary we use to analyze the corpus of the text is the 1910 Library of Congress subject heading. Um, in 1901, 
the Library of Congress began distributing its cataloging cards to libraries throughout the United States. Um, the cards had been created according to a agreed upon set of international rules by the American and British Library Association. And the 1910 version, which is the one that we've extracted for analysis, um, had become a national standard by that year. And this marks a useful time frame to apply contemporary versions um, of the encyclopedia to the encyclopedia and allows a general historically appropriate metadata list to apply vocabulary terms to synthesize knowledge as it was perceived during the time. <clears throat> So there's a system that we've developed here at Drexel University called Hive, helping interdisciplinary vocabulary. And because of the volume of the text, uh, we couldn't manually find metadata to all of the terms. So Hive is a linked data vocabulary server application. It supports a workflow for generating metadata and drawing terms from controlled vocabularies. Um, employing the LCSH 1910 as a vocabulary in the automation of metadata generation for the Encyclopedia Britannica is also facilitated by the markup of the terms using simple knowledge organization system conventions. <clears throat> so the persistent identifier type that we chose is the archival resource key. Uh, it is a decentralized form of identifier that is um, of draft standard and um, the persistent identifiers in general can enable the consolidation and linking of research outputs. The identifiers, uh, we chose them because of their low cost to implement, um, their decentralized nature and their flexibility. Uh, now, one of the reasons that we chose ARCs is because of the varying levels of uh, metadata that they support in order to describe their own persistence. So the idea is that um, persistence is not in the nature of this, the naming scheme applied. It is really a matter of service of the institution that supports the object that's being shared. Um, <clears throat> persistence as a service is a broad concept. It implies careful distinction between the identifiers, the objects identified, uh, and for example, some objects are strictly unchanging, others are subject to correction. A third class is subject to update and um, within a specific context, for example, permanent access to current weather conditions or to a home page. Uh, this is the ARC format, and this is also available in the slides that I've uploaded the presentation. Since we're short on time, I won't go over the specifics of the format, but it is also available as a draft standard from the IATF. Um, but a little bit more about ARCs and the nature of uh, human curation and uh, persistent identifiers. Um, you can see the um, this is a persistent identifier that um, the Louvre has assigned to uh, Leonardo's famous painting. So different aspects might have different identifiers. Uh, for instance, a digital image versus a physical object might have different identifiers. And um, this shows that um, there is usefulness in uh, cultural heritage institutions taking ownership of the identifiers that they curate so that they are in the best position to um, provide authoritative data on the objects they represent. Now, this doesn't mean that additional different organizations can't have metadata and persistent identifiers that uh, reference other collections, just that um, the scholar has a choice as to which identifier he or she uses um, in, order to, um, in order to reference the works. And this implies a level of curation on the part of the, the cultural heritage institution. So, as a conclusion, um, we and have chosen a specific time period to draw a vocabulary, which is 1910 LCSH, to analyze uh, historical data. And we intend to expand that to different uh, temporally appropriate uh, historical vocabularies that can help in um, uh, extracting metadata automatically uh, to describe uh, the corpus of the text. So I will conclude with that and
ask if there are any questions. Yeah, any question from for, for the Chris? It was an interesting presentation, and it was in aligned with the, this morning uh, workshop. It was about um, vocabularies, generally speaking. So, Chris, maybe I suggest you. I know it's it wasn't in your time zone, <laughs> so it was quite early here in Europe. Uh, but uh, we will publish, you know, recordings from that workshop at the YouTube channel. So maybe you can, you know, take a look and maybe you will find something useful there. Uh, do we have any question for the Chris here in um, in the chat or in Q and A? Seems we don't. <laughs> Anyway, I would like to thank you once again for being the part of this conference and for a nice presentation. And okay, there is one question, it seems. How the data been used in research projects? Can you give examples? It's a question from Radik, Radim Fladik. Uh, Peter, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I think uh, the easiest answer is to say that the, the metadata, which Chris so capably described, is being added to every entry from four different editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's about 100,000 entries. And I am using that metadata to segment the data set uh, into subgroups, which I can then uh, compare with one another and analyze in linguistic terms. Uh, I don't know how else we would do it if we didn't have that metadata. We can't simply search the titles of the entries because those titles changed from one edition to the next. Uh, so they're not stable, whereas the metadata uh, derived from the Hive automated indexing program uh, is stable. And so we can use it to group uh, all of these different entries uh, by uh, thematic material. And uh, that makes it uh, much easier to identify, for instance, whether or not the language of all the entries in the humanities, for example, became more complex or less complex over time and compare that with what happens to language in the engineering field or the science field. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Okay, thank you for the response and for, for the question, of course. And I think that Peter also mentioned there is a one uh, comment in the chat here from the Carol uh, that uh, the Hive workflows are they manual or automated? I think that Peter mentioned that it's automatically indexed, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, it is automatically indexed, um, mm -hmm. and that's the whole value of it to us, since we can't possibly manually index a hundred thousand different entries. We don't have that kind of budget for the librarians to do that work. <laughs> okay, thank you then very much for, for a nice discussion. And